right, let's go. Lift off to EP3, Curtis Garrett. We're here. This is technically take two since your internet provider decided to uh, rain on our parade yesterday. So thanks for coming back. Uh, I'll always come back. But yeah, they. Uh, I called them up. They said, yeah, we accidentally shut everybody off for, for a half an hour. So it was back quickly, but not good timing. I told oh. them to check with uh, Raid Hero and my carrier next time they were going to do that sort of thing yeah they're they're putting us out man don't, don't they know we're official we're like on spotify now that's as real as it gets <laughs> can't be kicking us off there, there's 20 oh, well, people game. out there that want to listen to us that's right <laughs> yeah just waiting for that 100 million dollar deal from from spotify i know then, then then we'll really make it um well yesterday we were we're gearing up to talk ai automation buzzword versus practical application right and we we just started getting on that when the internet gods decided to shut us down so i think we'll continue picking that back up on this conversation and see where some of these other things go i think i have some some uh pocket you know uh topics that we can cover here in the uh very near future as we get past ai and automation and let's see where this thing goes for episode three Let's do it. You were, I think when I dropped, you were like mid super wise, intelligent answer on, I had asked you about just what, you know, we see AI everywhere now in all the marketing. Yep. Um, there's a, there's a spectrum to that. There's some that use it well, I think, and use it strategically and it's legitimately there. And then there's others that like, I've seen websites where it's like, Here's an AI powered brokerage in a box. Just, you know, just click a button, away you go. It's all taken care of. We're just, we're not to that point. No, not at all. Um, but I think if you see what's happening, especially in the 3PL landscape, and this is where I think you're getting most of like the buzzword AI driven platform activity is because a lot of this, like most technical endeavors in our space usually launch within the 3PL community because unlike our, our true asset-based LTL counterparts, they're not buying industrial real estate, managing terminals, equipment, hiring drivers, right? So their reinvestment typically goes into technology or people. And I think what you've seen, and I think the biggest you know player in the game, C.H. Robinson, what they just reduced their sales force by like a third or something very recently. You and I both saw those headlines, and that only leads me to believe that they were probably already tinkering around with AI. You've seen softwares out there like uh, Tai or Tay Software, right, which are basically reading inbound emails, converting them into quotes, getting quotes into opportunities, right, without having the broiler room, Wolf of Wall Street backend management style, just dial in for dollars. Um, so I think I think I see a lot of use there, but I think it's bleeding into other avenues where they're like, we have AI or we have an algorithm that's going to solve this. And you and I both know that there's still people on the back end doing that, even like with live truckload rating in a lot of lot of aspects. Some of it's live rating, but the cover cover and track and trace and all that of the truck, a lot of that's still people on the back end. So I don't think it's as prevalent as what people think on the front end of a website. Yeah, the, the tie use case you mentioned, I really like that. Like that mm -hmm. specific narrow, it's it's a clear you know differentiator. Not only does a person not have to parse through an email and look for the pertinent information, but you know the technology does that. That's great. Um, it should still probably get kicked back to a person just to kind of approve and double check it. But either way, that that's a good solid use case. Mm -hmm. I was going to say there were some headlines months ago about, you know, these like self checkout stores that Amazon, Whole Foods and some, some companies have tested and trialed. There there was like a, an outing essentially of that the true AI wasn't actually working. And there was, you know, a bunch of people somewhere in the world watching cameras, literally just adding products to the to the customer's oh, yeah. bill. <laughs> as they were checking out. Yeah. So that that's a prime example, no pun intended on prime, but prime example of, you know, like 
it, say it, I can't remember for sure. Say it was Amazon. That's a what the biggest company in the world or top three biggest companies yep. in the world. If they're not even, you know, just completely smooth. Hey, tech from mm -hmm. A to Z. I mean, I guess I'm trying to pat ourselves on the back a little bit in our industry. It, it's going to take a while to get there. One other thing I was thinking of is something I don't hear as much when it when it you know when folks are talking about the the large language models and AI communication. It's not only speed and consistency, but we talked previously about you know somebody fresh out of college uh, coming into a to a new you know say it's a brokerage or carrier mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, they're going to come in at different levels, you know, different levels of capability, intelligence, experience. So what AI can do is be a consistency mechanism mm -hmm. where it's not just speed and efficiency. You get those two, but having kind of that, you know, that standardized or, or uniform just response structure and uh, process to, you know, taking these emails or these requests, these opportunities in. That's that's huge, too. That's I mean, there's a lot of soft benefits there that people might not even know how to quantify yet just from a, a brand, you know, uniformity perspective. Yeah. And, and I think that's one in the 3PL space you see quite a bit where you have turnover on the sales floor and it's just rotating that book of business to the next young man or woman that comes in there and thinks they're going to light the world on fire and just going about the same thing. So I totally feel you on the consistency thing, but that really splits to me an avenue here in different modes of transportation, AI or large language models are going to make impacts different than they will in different modes, right? And like my, my example of this is with LTL, you already have a lot of consistency. That's why LTL is beautiful. You have the spoken hub model, you have trucks in certain areas every day to pick up and bring back as we're with truckload, there's a lot less visibility, digitization, right? Asynchronous flow of information. So like what we just talked about, how AI is applied there is almost on, to your point, the human interaction of fielding and receiving inbound requests in several different formats, whether it be email, online platforms, into one area, get things back, right? Return rate quotes, communicate effectively and consistently to your point. And then with LTL, I think there's a completely separate use case of how you can leverage AI in language models as a whole, because while LTL is extremely consistent, damn it, we've done a good job at making it overly complex in certain areas, right? So like at Rate Hero, where you're at, I know you're already messing around with language models to read my favorite public document ever, the general rules tariff. Right. So it's reading that to help shippers stay, you know, out of trouble and within bounds. So let's yeah. talk to me about some of the use cases that you think exist within LTL where language models and AI can practically be applied quickly, effectively, and for, you know, a quantitative purpose of like ROI or, you know, money, money solves all. So that's why we're doing it. Right. Yeah. I thought you were going to say the constitution is your favorite document, but we'll, we'll go with the rules tariffs. <laughs> well, that's my favorite document, but I was being a little facetious there. You know what I mean? Everybody's I favorite. Oh, just, did you not read the rules tariff? That's why you got that charge, Curtis. You didn't know. Right. It's, it's the mother of all, you know, like Trump, uh, state statements of like just trumping whatever. Well, I didn't know. I didn't agree. Well, it's in the rules tariff, yep. <laughs> you know, and, we, we've talked about that a bit, you know, in, in past episodes on just terms and conditions and, and what really should be in a rules tariff. But no matter what changes, if anything, in mm -hmm. the near term, it is one of the perfect use cases to use with with LLMs. And so we, we've been training some models at Rate Hero uh, on specific carriers, specific rules tariffs. And it's interesting the testing, you know, that we've been doing internally, but it's live on our website and there's other people interacting with it as well. It's very thoughtful and very, you know, specific in how it works through the the, the question or, or mm -hmm. how it brings an answer to the point where you can even challenge it and say, well, how did you get to that? And then it'll it'll lay it all out there for you. Fun fact on that. So we created Tariff Hero, which is on like our homepage. Mm -hmm. And then there's another, there's an option you can click on Tariff Villain, 
and it's it's all the same uh, logic behind it. It's the same training, but it it has a personality of kind of like a you know a gruff Uncle Tim or or Uncle Joe and Freight, yeah. and it makes you kind of feel silly for asking the questions, which that <laughs> that kind of fits with our industry a little bit too. It does but, once you get downstream enough to deal with a person like the traffic guy that's going to answer your question, who's just so yeah. over getting his 800th version of this question. Yeah. But like, again, I, I love comparing other industries, right? If I go to book a plane ticket mm -hmm. or rent a car, am I reading through all 200 pages of their terms and conditions? Never, no. ever have I done that. Never. Because... One, it's a it's a better customer experience. They kind of like flow and prompt you through, you know, yep. the the critical parts. And then the other part is, and we talked about this before, most of what's in there is catastrophic. It's extreme exceptions. It's not necessarily things that come up, you know, in 80% or more of the typical transaction to a customer. And yet here we are in LTL. Really, I mean, unless you're shipping just perfect, consistent square pallets. You really do have to know and 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 dive into and read those rules tariffs with you know with almost every shipment. So yeah, the 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 chat you know chat GPT or large language model uh, version for reading you know 150 to 200 200 page PDF document is is a perfect use case. Yep, and that in conjunction with you know the email scenarios, anything that just takes, you know, uh, labor, whether it's you, me, somebody in, you know, China, Russia, it doesn't matter where they are. But if, if somebody's stopping what they're doing, getting their head out of like their strategic, you know, running and gunning business mindset, and they have to go over here and do what essentially is like academic research, sometimes it, it just doesn't flow with like, you know, good, efficient business practices. So Great, great use case. I, I, I'm curious if any of the carriers will put one out there. Maybe it's too early because, you know, you still have models hallucinating and, and it is, um, you still have to kind of, you know, put, put some, uh, some filters on what you're taking in and run it through your own common sense checks. Yeah. But I think for, for 80, you know, 80 to 90% of, of LTL shippers and brokers specifically, and, and really the transactional ones that they're shipping, you know, inconsistent lanes, maybe even inconsistent products. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the perfect tool to just turn to. For, for me, the real challenge is how do you weave in the AI or language model into an existing workflow of, and what I mean by that is you going to get the rate quote and it's 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 doing this in real time while you're inputting your origin, destination, commodity information against the carriers you're rating against, right? So if I'm a shipper and I have five different carriers I do business with, I'm gonna send that rate call to five carriers. How can I do it in real time? Because like in the scenario you gave me where I have a tool or application that I could go to read the rules tariff, I'm typically going there after I've got caught, right? After something happened and it is usually the result of the invoice coming in. What is this item 129? What do you mean if it's over 75 inches, I get charged? What do you mean you may charge for this? Are you gonna, or are you not gonna? Why did it happen on this one and not the other? How do you catch that in real time, right? And I right. think that's something that we're gonna be in a little bit of a standoff in this industry. If you look at the closest model to us, right, which is parcel, forever it was kind of a duopoly. You have FedEx and UPS. That's kind of been broken up and disintermediated because of technology, which is a good thing. But now over on LTL, if I'm the first one, and we talked about this when we tried starting the episode yesterday, is pioneers versus settlers. If I'm the pioneer that goes, man, I'm going to put address validation on the front of my website. I'm going to have it read my rules tariff and catch all these extra charges up front. If I'm the only one in the game doing that, am I doing myself a disservice because now I will present, albeit accurate, more expensive than my peer groups who are not doing this? Now, they might win that shipment, piss off a customer after they send the invoice because 30% of their invoices don't match. But like, how, how does it get practically applied there? And I, I know it's easier for me to answer that at my carrier where we have a platform 
And I know that the customers in our platform, if I am able to get this right, are going to experience that with whoever they rate against. And I could weave it into that workflow. But I'm not 100% of all domestic business that goes on as selfishly as much as I would love to be that, right? Then I could be at home wearing wearing my robe and, and drinking cavassiers or something. But that's not the case today. So like, how do you how do you get it into the shipper's hand? How do you change the industry, right, with all this different fragmentation and all yeah. these different rules and everything? It's a tough spot if I'm a shipper to know all this. That's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Like I've always said, if you look at the top 25 LTL carriers who are everybody or everything to everybody in this industry, mm -hmm. nobody wants to be the first or the first mover or the last. Nobody wants to be high or low. They all kind of just migrate to the middle. And that that's applicable in a lot of ways, like just yeah. communication of information, rates, obviously, service. Um, you, you sit down, you could sit down with one, you know, VP of sales from each one of those 25 carriers. And the message is, is going to sound pretty similar a lot of the time. Now, there's exceptions and, you know, there's there's cool other parallel service, you know, abilities that some carriers have. I'm thinking of like favorite with their division that does the concert tours and and that sort yep. of the concert logistics. So obviously, you know, outside cases, but but largely speaking, if you're if you're sitting down to get information or or negotiate a program for standard LTL traffic, then it's hard to tell them apart. And mm -hmm. that's a good point. Um it's we've seen that, you know, as as companies like Shiplify and others have sprung up to get to help the industry become more precise there is definitely a culture and i've heard this from several people at several carriers behind the scenes just is it going to hurt us for a while like if if we're even if we're right that still means we're gonna maybe be lower down on the rating grid in the tms and yep. we're not going to get chosen and so to your point you're right i mean the the, the carrier not doing those things might win a few more shipments and, you know, that customer might peel off, but it just, that's kind of, it's hard to quantify that, right? Yeah. It's, there's no way to forecast, well, we're going to get all this business in mid 2025 because X carrier will have messed up enough by, you know, you just can't yeah. do that. So, well, and, and it's tough because you think about service providers too, like, like Old Dominion in particular, and I know Todd's bullish on this one rate one time. Right. You and I both have great relationships with him. He's a very sharp guy, been in this industry a long time. So, like, is the school of thought that what you mentioned, I, I might sacrifice a little bit up front, but how long is that kind of bell curve or adoption curve on the customer realizing that that truly is one rate, one time? That while it might show on there $25 more expensive, it is like a 99% accuracy rating that, that that rate up front is what I'm going to get on the back end. Yeah. But your point, what's that adoption look like to get the consumer to adjust to those buying habits? Right. Especially when in LTL, I mean, there's 80 different what I'll call common LTL carriers fragmented across the country, even though you and I both know that the top 10 are probably doing about 95 percent of the overall volume. They're still out there. How do you yeah. change? Yeah, OD is a great example because that's been their M.O for decades, largely because of Todd and, and mm -hmm. some of the other leaders there where they've had the attitude of, you know, we need to do what's right, what's accurate, and, and definitely what makes sense for us as a business. And if we lose a customer in the short term because of that, you know, we don't want to see that. But I remember countless times through my my tenure in W&I at Old Dominion and then pricing, costing, we would essentially, you know, appear to have lost a customer and Todd would be like, don't worry, they'll be back because yeah. <laughs> they're going to go somewhere else. They're going to experience, you know, a different type of pain. Um, but yeah, to the question around like the adoption curve, I think timing, just timing in the market is a huge player here. Like if if things like this were a little further advanced and ready to be game time ready, essentially like during COVID, where everybody had all that pain, shippers yeah. felt like they had no control, they would have gladly, you know, paid a little more or even a lot more in some cases to get the accuracy, to get fewer invoice discrepancies, fewer service issues. But 
the mindset people, you know, we all have a uh, short term amnesia or something because just a couple of years past now and it's been kind of a softer market for a little while. Everyone's just kind of gung ho about those rates and driving yep. prices back down and stuff like this. It, I mean, I think any time is a good time to build it. So for, again, the Shiplifies and some of the projects we're doing at Rate here, what you guys are doing with yeah. trying to digitize everything like, you know, it needs to be done and it we're at the point where it it can't wait. It, it just needs to be done, whether it's a loose market, tight market, whatever. But I think for that true adoption, it might take another full market cycle loop to get shippers in, in a, you know, shippers and brokers essentially yeah. to a point where they're like, we, we don't have the control that we want or that we'd like in this situation. So what can we improve? If it's not price, it's going to have to be investment in, you know, the tech, yeah. the process, the just things that drive accuracy in LTL. I think that there's enough with AI today between large language models, how you can apply them, including other tools out there like smart address validation through companies like Shiplify or even trying to do it on your own that could dramatically improve the customer experience in LTL. But I think we've just stumbled upon the conclusion that the real challenge here is the go to market or route to market to deliver this to the customers. And like you said, it creates this migration to the middle where nobody's willing to be the, the pioneer and the first one to change this because there's on one end of change, there's the sacrifice and potential revenue. And how long does that last? Yeah. Right. Or do we trust in what we're doing and we stay the course and we drag this industry through this? Yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on like the digital council? Are, are they are they the right group to kind of like lead the way and, and drag carriers in? Or is it more just a group of collaborators and we're, you know, they're kind of coming to a consensus of what can we all deal with that's acceptable? And th this is difficult for me because on one aspect of it, I think it's absolutely a necessity and it's great to start creating uniformity based on all the problems we just mentioned, right? Some people have their own density scale. Some people have their own rules. It's all different across the board and it deteriorates the customer experience. On the other end of that, boy, would I love for it to move faster and more concise to get to where I know that the industry needs to go, right? So I guess like I, I view it as absolutely necessary, but I do wish that we could speed up the pace of play and get to the, the outcomes that are more desirable for the community as a whole. We know that there's net benefit to the carrier. There's net benefit to the customer by eliminating con confusion and having more, more uniformity right across the board. So there's a net benefit to everybody. It's just going to take some change. Yeah, and you saying that made me think it maybe it's two separate issues where um like you've got the things like a standardized electronic bill lading API architecture. That's not that doesn't need to be a competitive advantage for any one carrier. That's something that just should be agreed Standard. upon. Yeah. And so, but then you have a lot of other obviously just technology in general, but but you know, artificial intelligence initiatives that will be competitive edges when it comes to routing line haul optimally and mm -hmm. P and D routes. And, you know, a lot, a lot of low hanging fruit, I think on the dock, like if you think back to, especially a good sized dock, hundred doors or more, you got OS and D freight tucked away here and there. You've got, you know, you've got people still walking the dock, doing dock checks to physically get eyes on yep. things. And so that's something to think about too. AI is not just constrained to text, right? Like if there's camera applications, there's video, there's all kinds of, you know, motion sensors. So to really, to really automate a dock um, and be able to have, you know, the eye in the sky essentially looking for freight or, or monitoring, uh, you know, volume and, and, and traffic and all these different things in different parts of a big dock, that's, that would just purely be a huge differentiator if one carrier rolled that out. Oh, for sure. Like to be able to get to the point where you've digitized 
the ingestion of information in a uniformed way that now you could start leveraging AI for things like load factor inside of a trailer with cameras as you start building those outbound loads and stacking and racking and bagging, right? Okay, you know, could you imagine? I, I remember moving a dock on paper and walking up and down. What is my PDX door? What is my DFW door? Where am I at? You know what yeah. I mean? Communicating with the hostler. Hey, you've got you got to pull door two, door 42, door three, need new empties. Imagine being able to holistically look at this on your dock map with little percentages to full, knowing what you have coming in either online or from your P&Ds to go, okay, like, dude, I need to talk to Jose Alvarez over here running my whatever route. Like, he's got freight. I need to close out this trailer and get it back in there. Yeah. Like, there, there's totally. a whole it's, world of possibility, but yeah. I look at it like this. I think one of the hardest challenges LTL carriers have, period, is the customer behavioral fragmentation that exists in the market. And they created it. They absolutely created it. This is like me being mad at my kids because I give them candy every night before bed <laughs> and them being upset when I cut this off. That they're like, where is where's the candy? Right? It's like that scene in Step Brothers where they're like, This is a giant bag of horse shit. You it's Shark Week. Right? This is yeah. how shippers like because we've allowed them to behave in this way, where they could literally create a bill of lading, a legally tendering document on a barroom napkin and have it picked up and proed, right? Is part of the problem that exists is that, that that's my my problem with pace of play. I wish we would get together in a room and agree that every single shipment that's tendered to us should be complete with this required information in this format. Otherwise, we're not picking it up, right? Yeah. Parcel yeah. does that. Like even if I have to return stuff on Amazon or whatever my wife buys, she'll send me labels at work that I print and bring home so she can put them on the box. I don't want to hear it from you people out there that I don't have an at-home printer. I threw it away because it never gets used enough. But yes, like I'll print things and bring them home and that thing doesn't get picked up or dropped off at the UPS store or wherever it is without that label, right? But yeah. in LPL, it is Sounds the, like you uh, you and your wife need a return API and a label maker at the house. I, I don't I don't even want to go down that route. I don't need to speed up <laughs> the, the pace of play on that end. Right? I'm trying to speed the e-com flywheel. Yeah. Yeah. Something you said earlier stuck out. Also, by the way, my mind went down this path around the cool loading and dock possibilities. <laughs> like with having say you had a camera trained on every open trailer at the dock. That's not only, you know dimensioning and, and recording characteristics of each individual piece of freight, but the order that it's loaded in, like you, you, you might, you know, the system could say, Hey, we have a piece, a hot piece that was just picked up. It's a guaranteed shipment coming in They're 10 minutes out. Just stop loading this trailer because the space you have right there is exactly what you need mm -hmm. or even pull that pallet out, move that one up in the air. And that, you know, just kind of, it's like playing Tetris on God yep. mode. <laughs> like having all the cheats mm -hmm. but back to back to what i was saying you said initially you know the the ai buzzwords are popping up more in the broker world which i agree mm -hmm. because they they don't have the assets and liability you know of, of physically moving goods around the world and and so where do they spend and reinvest their money yeah it's going to be primarily in technology and people so I think the stage we're at just to kind of like wrap this up into maybe two or three phases is we're at the point now where AI is starting to help administratively. You know, if we can cut down on emails, if we can, if we can get quicker turnaround, you know, better reading and understanding of rules tariffs, that's helping sales reps, customer service reps, you know, pricing analysts, people working in the office. But there's a whole frontier of on the dock, as we just mentioned, eventually, you know, routing and, and doing different things out on the road. Like it, we're just getting started with how how much AI will really infiltrate and I think, you know, level up the market. Yeah. I'm I'm with you there. Um so we've we've covered some ideas on how you could use it on the shipper's end. I think what you mentioned, 
like on the carrier side of the fence, boy, does that like get me wild with ideas on how you could create AI driven software just to optimize what's going on within the footprint of a dock, whether you're a distribution center, like a shipper, or you're full on operational moving freight at a cross dock, like an LTL carrier would, right? Right. I think there's a, a lot of possibility. What do you think AI does? And I think a lot of people think this way. I, I personally think it's a negative way at this point, but a lot of people think, well, AI and machine learning, large language models eliminates my job, right? I view large language models in AI as just like anything else. It's an emerging new technology. He or she who leans into it benefits from emerging technology, can play offense with it. And I think the people that will go by the wayside are the ones that don't understand how to leverage it, live within it, to use it to accelerate and you know double down on what they could do in a given day. Because I look at it like this, like with ChatGPT and how I use it in certain ways, is ingestion of information, simplifying information, formatting, call notes and emails, and and me being able to get things done X amount faster than I could have without it. Yeah. So like where do you view that within LTL? I don't I don't really see it eliminating a lot of jobs at all. I see it maybe eliminating through natural attrition. So I had 20 people in my traffic department and as the language model gets better and I could train it to read things and look at things as people go, I don't have to rehire and I can continue working down as tasks eliminate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I don't think LTL has the most like aligned labor allocation. And what I mean by that is look at every carrier out there who, which departments always behind, always underwater, Pricing is one of those departments, right? They've got one just because it's a steep learning curve and yep. you can't just plug anyone in and get them up to speed. You have a lot of long time, you know, lifer type pricing people, lifer in a good way that know their craft. And I mean, they, they carry the the company's weight on their shoulders in a lot of ways with, with pricing and, and growing profitable opportunities. So you you stick some AI tools into into the middle of a pricing team, suddenly they feel like they're current, they're ahead of the game, they're making better decisions. There's so many little things, like just in my average day of working through different analyses and things that I do, you know, there's always data missing, there's holes in what you get sent. So I need to go out and find three zip codes that weren't on the the, the file I was sent. Or I need to verify some addresses, or I need to do this. Like all these things that were Google, Googleable, but still manual and took time. Now, if you can write a decent prompt and tell ChatGPT or whatever other model exactly what you need, and it's public access, they can summarize that, they can format it for you, they can put it in a CSV or Excel version and export it. Like, so you're just like snipping away at all these little context switching, brain drain type activities that we all have just gotten used to doing. Um, but then, uh, yeah. So when you first asked the question, what I was thinking was, again, I, I think in terms of like spectrums, right? This side, this extreme, this extreme, and then what's kind of probably the majority or, or mm -hmm. the reasonable middle. Um, there's still, there's a lot of people that don't, if you walked up and said, Hey, how often do you use chat GPT? They'd say, what's chat GPT? Like, yeah. We, you know, you and I talk about it, that the people generally in our circles are aware, but there's a large amount of the population out there that just has no idea. And, and that, so that's one end where, yeah, there could be some disruption in, in jobs and opportunities from people because they're not even aware that it exists. Yeah. Then you have the other extreme end where you have people, you know, now writing entire uh, blog posts, narratives, social media content contracts, you know, not legal advice, but uh, doing all kinds of stuff that they used to have to outsource or wait on, you know, kind of put the ball in somebody else's court uh, or just do it themselves. And it took longer. Those are the people where they're not, it, it's only going to help them. They're not going to lose their job. They're not going to get paid less. They're going to have more time to do, you know, the things and, and think deeper and, and kind of I think do what humans are more made to do. And then what I think the middle is are people that are aware of it and some may be scared of it, some may be excited, 
but a lot of the AI intervention that's going to come in and, and really assist them, they probably won't even realize it's there because mm -hmm. it's going to get woven into software platforms yeah. and tools. And it's going to mean, you know, quicker and easier training at a new job. It's going to mean, like you mentioned with, you know, in a TMS, as you're typing in the, the information, AI is already kind of working behind the scenes and validating and suggesting and checking different things. So that's, I think, it, as far as like, say, you're, you know, the middle class working world where you have some knowledge workers, you've got, you know, well-paid uh, commercial drivers, dock workers, mechanics. There's going to be a lot of aspects of AI that have already crept in and will do so more. And they couldn't even tell you what it was, but it's a value add because yeah. it, it's going to make their job more, more, more enjoyable and more valuable. Well, now, now that you mention it, I think one of the biggest lifts this could probably bring an LTL carrier is on the pricing side with leveraging this thing to, you know what I mean, do certain, certain activities or tasks to scale those efforts up. Not only that, but could like, and you and I know this is when you're running a huge pricing team, right? Or you're at a national carrier, you have all your inbound requests from the field, three PLs, two PL folks out there that are going to analysts that are fielding these things in. And then you have what is hard to do, which is rationalizing accounts on a regular basis, trying to keep up with them. I almost think using this thing to rationalize accounts, keep pulses on things and, and read it that way is a great way to have machine learning work in an automated way where it's it's looking at stuff that's already existing. So now I can only focus on the inbound. Then I could take this thing and have it start reading or building RFPs or, or grading them on a weighted averages based on the completeness of the information and start figuring out where I can leverage it on the pricing side. I think that, and I didn't think about that before, but that's something where I think you could really reduce a lot of time to task activities and improve your overall purview on how you rationalize and look at accounts on a daily basis, right? Yeah. Like, like the market monitoring. share going up or down or whatever it is, like really, really looking at it. Yeah. No, that, that's a great point. I agree. Um, the the whole AI can kind of help close the loop on things. Like I, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, when, when an address is, is updated or, or say the shipper learns, Hey, I do need a certain accessorial on this. Quite often they keep making those same mistakes over and over again because the TMS just doesn't capture and save mm -hmm. that information. So some sort of a like, you know, monitor, capture, and then update mechanism through AI, that would be great. And then on the pricing side, the first the first question that comes to my mind, okay, if I'm a, if I'm running a carrier pricing department, why am I telling all my pricing analysts to take renewals and increases? on the year, on you know, on the year anniversary date, why wouldn't I look at how profitable certain accounts are? And if one is operating really, really profitably, why go like upset the apple cart and potentially run them off to another, to a competitor by taking an increase when it was already operating at a 75 OR? Like, or could, could you take that opportunity and instead of giving them an increase, encourage the behavior that we want and say, hey, Normally you'd get an increase, you know what I mean, every year. I'd be willing to save off this general rate increase if you were to convert and give me full e-bill lading with dimensions and do business in this manner. Because right now I just, I pick up bill of ladings, which are great, but I don't know what's in that truck I pick up until my P&T driver gets back every day. So you're putting me behind the eight ball. I love your business. I love your account. I want to work better with you. And this is what I think is missing as a whole Right. And I know this is a segue from the AI conversation, how to use it. But the general rate increase really hit me on this. They happen every year. Right. And I know they'll say like FedEx just took one. What was FedEx is five, nine, five point nine. Is that what they just hit? Something like that. I, I, I don't. But you know, that's not every that's single FedEx. shipper. Yeah. Every single shipper doesn't get five point nine. It's washed across the mix. Some get no increases. Some get a seven percent increase. Averages out at five point nine. But like what drives me nuts is we have all this behavior that we want to change and get better information from the customer so we can have better net outputs as far as efficiency gains and all the stuff we just talked about. But if I have no mechanism 
on how to encourage or change the customer's behavior, then all is I'm going to do is continue to invest in my operation and buy all these tools to make up for what should be transferred to the front end of this problem. And you've seen this in LTL. LTL, when you think of technology, a majority of the money ever spent, period, goes into that doc efficiency, goes into line haul optimization, goes into P&D route optimization, or into pricing optimization. It all goes within their four walls. And what's funny to me is you're continually trying to fix, right, the problem that the sh- that have been created because the shippers are doing business in a way that makes you augment how you have to operate business internally. Yep. That makes me think of the more hard constraints you have with your customer relationships, I think yes. that fosters behavior like that, where to get anything fixed or or to, you know, almost like the way people used to fight wars. They line up in front of each other. One side gets a turn. They shoot the muskets, then the other mm-hmm. side. And it's just like repositioning. <clears throat> it's not fluid, right? Yep. So the carrier's like, all right, pricing is effective today. It's do for release, you know, for, for renewal a year from now. What if what if the carrier behavior or or sorry, the carrier constraints by saying this is good for a year is actually trickling down into the behavior of why shippers are always doing annual RFPs, mm-hmm. which carriers that you know, nobody likes that. Nobody likes doing the work. Carriers don't like to be re reshopped and evaluated every 12 months. But hey, you you said from the get go. This is good for a year. So basically in a year, like you either got to come back to me and I'm going to ask for more money typically, or you got to find somebody else like that kind of sets in a, you know, a bit of a scarcity uh, feeling and and like a runway that you're running out of. So maybe around the increase of the GRI thing is just a whole mindset shift might be needed where it's like with the help of AI and other technology that can, you know, dynamically monitor and mm-hmm. and patrol these accounts it's more of just like a say a quarterly you know check in or uh it, it's not like this big loom looming you know doom and gloom event of like your your renewals coming out like i i still hate getting increases you know the email from the carrier rep we've reviewed your account this due yeah. on this and most carriers in my experience don't use it as an opportunity for growth. Uh, like by by that, I mean, if you have a 75 OR account and you can go to that customer and say, hey, if I hold rates, will you give us more? Then obviously that's more net revenue You know, at the end yeah. of the day than taking a 5% just like clockwork because you're, you're stamping widgets in the factory and that's all you know how to do. And, and then they they take half the business away. Like it's all, it's missing the forest for the trees. It's like, yeah, I got my increase. I'm so happy I negotiated that. But then what happens to the business? It sometimes splinters and falls away. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And this, this to me is kind of asinine as a whole, the way this works. Um, And again, it goes back to like, if I've got a shipper, to your point, they're operating at a 75, they're doing business with me in a format I want. I get all my information up front take care of the customers that are taking care of you. And I know there's a lot of carriers out there that do a good job with this, but this whole pricing thing drives me nuts. Like when you were, when you were on your 3PL side of the fence and we both have 3PL experience, I would have blanket rates and I'm sure you had blanket rates. So you have two separate sides of the house. I got my managed services play. I do CSP. That's great. What do you think you operated on your, your blanket accounts? Like give me a net, uh, a, a net total of revenue and like how many customers you think we're in there. Like, okay, it was a hundred million dollars on about twenty thousand customers, something like that. Yeah. See, I was always in companies that were more CSP heavy, less less on the blanket sides, but I get what you're saying. Where it's yeah. it's many more customers at a lower average revenue per customer, but also probably a lot more profitable per customer too. Yeah. You know, your blanket bucket of business is probably gonna operate at, at a twenty plus percent margin. Yeah. Where you're, you're managed, you know, you might sign a big shipper as a 3PL for, for a 3% cost plus and be overjoyed with that. So but, but my thing with this is like, and you sat on pricing teams for carrier for 3PL, like if 
I, why in the world, and you're already seeing this change in the right way, and I believe this is the right change. In no way, if a customer does $200,000 in total revenue, should they have any type of unique tariff or pricing for that account? It just needs, and you're seeing this with dynamic pricing is finally solving this. The three PLs have left them a beautiful blueprint. You know what I mean? Like if you're one of the bigger 3PLs out there that operates a lot on like a blanket program, you probably have 100,000 shippers doing whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue on that blanket. That's one tariff I have to manage, one yeah, for thousands of customers, right? And now you're seeing LTL carriers use that same blueprint, but with dynamic pricing. And each one of them are doing it a little different, which is fine. They've all got their own secret ingredients, even though they're baking the same bread, they've got different stuff that goes in there. Yeah. But I'm finally seeing that change. I would just like to see it happen a little faster and a little cleaner. But to your point, there's a lot of unknown with that. And, you know, you don't you don't want to hedge your bet because we have seen, I won't name names, we've definitely seen LTL carriers that have tried to pioneer the uh, dynamic pricing and have lost their ass in certain avenues. Yeah. And maybe that's because they were a leader and they took the risk and, and it yeah. didn't work out. Or maybe because, you know, they just they didn't truly know their costs as well as they should have. But mm -hmm. that's in, in that scenario where you're you're truly having like a, a transactional or spot dynamic pricing program. You really have to know your costs because you're not you're not able to cost out and model each shipper because you don't even know, you know, which ones you're going to see day to day. So as long as you have you know, your overhead and all your all your dynamic costs nailed down, then it really doesn't matter who the per you know, who the company is giving you freight so long that they're credit worthy and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, that that's that's the way I personally see the blanket or transactional side of, of LTL going is more just an even playing field, but more often changing as well based on each carrier's own needs and costs. Mm -hmm. And that's where you will see a lot more, I think, a lot more differentiation. Because uh, think about this. If you have a big CSP account, like, yeah, carrier A versus carrier B might have terminals in different locations. One might be an hour down the road. One might be close. But it, it generally takes the same amount of equipment, people, and capacity, you know, to service a, a dedicated, consistent account. And so that's where you see a lot more similarities, you know, in, in carrier price, albeit there's there's union, non-union, all that stuff. But mm -hmm. if you're talking true transactional, that's where, you know, they might have had a huge rollout that moved a bunch of equipment west and now they have to get those empties back. And so they're going to, you know, really ratchet down on those those eastbound lanes to try to move that equipment back and fill it up. And that's that's really, I think the transactional side is really going to be impacted a lot more just by business day to day at each carrier mm -hmm. versus, you know, versus the big national account CSP approach. Yeah. And I, I do think, and, and this has been a big theme of this episode is customer behavior. I think there's a, a challenge, right? Where if I'm a customer, because of the pricing environment I've been in with LTL forever, Right. I'm used to that one year. This is my set price. This is my discount. Right. And I hate it. Like everybody focuses on discount. This is my discount. This is this is what I have. The only thing that's changing is fuel. Right. I can live with that. Then they come and you got to move them to a dynamic program upon renewal, which I do think is a net benefit for both parties. But the customer, I don't think, understands that. When you say dynamic, they're like, you mean my price is going to change all the time every day? And I don't know what that is or is going to be. When in reality, you know that if they've got a good portion of their freight or or freight that is in a good mix where it's, you know, higher higher weight per shipment, multi-bill pickup every day, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money if you break it, it's easy to load into trailers, you're going to win no matter what. This is just simplifying things, right? So I, I do think that there, again, it goes back to customer behavior and how do you incent that behavior and I think this is a huge thing that's missing with all this stuff that we have changing right right now in LTL. Like we made that analogy when we tried to do this show yesterday. Like I was always the kid that dumped out all the Legos on the floor and wanted to figure out what I could build. I hated instructions. Right now, 
Legos are getting dumped in the form of technology all over the shipper side, the carrier side. And I think it's really hard for them to figure out what to build, what to build first, how to prioritize this. How am I going to measure the automation behind this? Is the bang worth the buck on this? Oh, by the way, I also have to win today and and focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. To that point, like if you think about how many just say broker coined TMS platforms are out there as far as if I if I'm starting a 3PL, what are my options for a TMS? There's thousands, right? Mm -hmm. We're we're gonna get to that point with all these other more narrow specific tools. There might be 25 different Shiplify competitors. There might be, you know, uh there might be a hundred different just purely rating or pricing engines that are mm -hmm. all plugins to different systems. So it's only getting more prevalent again with AI, it's getting quicker and easier and cheaper to build software as well. That's that's another huge benefit that uh, isn't specific to us in LTL, but it's definitely going to it's going to impact us. Um, so, yeah, it's getting more complex with more choices so that. I guess uh, on one hand, I think we're always going to have problems. They're just going to change. Right. And we yes. can. That's a good thing. There's always stuff to to figure out, challenge ourselves with. Um. But yeah, that we're 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 in the middle of Lego dumping time. I agree. Mm -hmm. It's everyone's kind of rolling up to the circle, you know, in kindergarten, getting getting the big bad barrel out or getting the little uh fancy little thing with the plans, but they're dumping their Lego out and building. Yep. So we're almost coming up on an hour here, even with my my bathroom break here. Let's uh, let's leave it with some some words of wisdom here, Curtis Garrett, on uh, on on any of the subjects we talked about. What do you want to What do you want to leave us with and close out our our show on? Gosh, we uh, yeah. It, I wish I had a map of everywhere we went because we were <laughs> we were all over the place. But I think so here's the here's the thing. I think any any major change in any industry and ours is an interesting one because yes we're smaller in just pure dollars but there's so many moving parts that all combine different ways there there are so many you know major market players from both a carrier and a broker perspective mm -hmm. so it has a complexity of a much larger market i would say it all starts with behavioral change with change management and everything's connected that you know that i know for sure so if you're a carrier and you want more shippers and brokers using ebols there's got to be incentives that are aligned there's got to be skin in the game on both sides you have to you have to kind of lead them to water to drink you, you can't mm -hmm. just say hey this is what we want now so you got to do it and then even worse is saying this is what we want but then still you know enabling the the less than desirable behavior so I guess I don't know what my overall point is. I'm just I'm just pointing out that it, it won't just take, you know, a bunch of us sitting in rooms kumbayaing and collaborating on councils by any means. We need that stuff behind the scenes to think and build the right way. But I think just more transparency, more communication conversations like this and, you know, getting the wheels in people's minds churning for anybody that watches this uh that's, we're all going to learn by doing, we're all going to improve ourselves. You're going to have all these other outside forces, you know, the market cycles and which yep. carrier goes out of business this year and which union contracts coming up and all that stuff is always going to be swirling around. But as long as we all focus on, okay, at the end of the day, what allows me as a carrier, a service provider in, in a very difficult market to you know, make my customer feel warm and fuzzy at the end of the day. And like they had, you know, done what they asked of us while still being profitable, getting better, getting more profitable. I hope LTL carriers get to, you know, below 50 ORs because that means doesn't mean they just raise prices. It means they're cutting out costs. They're getting better, smarter, more efficient. Yeah. So Sorry, that's a long answer, but it kind of goes hand in hand with our conversation today. A little bit random. No, it, it it's good. It was a good bow tie to, to put on everything because if you don't incent the behavior, and where I think the real gap is, and I'll leave you with this for my words of wisdom, right, is revenue trumps all, 
right? Money is the leading motivator of any business, unless you're just trying to, you know, set up a nonprofit and do good stuff, which I encourage you, but you still need money, right? So like, is the incentivization, is automation enough meat on the bone to start incenting behavior? And what I mean by that is, how much total savings do you get by fully adopting e-bill lighting and complete? Because e-bill lighting could be, I just sent you an e-bill lighting, but guess what? I don't require dimension, so I, it's not complete. But it is by the standard of I sent it in 2.0. I mean, full entirety e-bill lighting. Then you take the next step, and can I automatically bill this without any clerical entry? What percentage can I get to auto bill no touch, right? And is that 3%? Of, of savings? How many ROI points is that? And is it worth it, me moving in that direction? My words of wisdom are, I don't think the industry as a whole, or even as an individual carrier has completely figured out the connective tissue behind all of this. I think there's assumptions on it. We have some ideas on it, but because nobody's really done this, like, with all of their business, obviously, they might have done it with portions or single providers, but it's really hard, I think, to quantify and then publicize that quantification to the industry in like a committee to be like, hey, guys, these are our results. This is the real savings. Then you get them going in that right direction. I think that's the secret missing ingredient across the board is consensus. And it'll be different by carrier. How much do I really save and how much does this hit my bottom line to incent me to incent my customer? I don't it know. I asked a lot of carriers and I got a lot right. of different answers. Yeah. No, that that was a that was a wise deep that that's a big question slash yeah. statement. But it is the carriers that will I think benefit in reducing their costs with technology and AI the mm -hmm. most. Yes. Because there, that's where all the inefficiency is and the blind spots and all just the, what you get with, you need a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of buildings, a whole bunch of acres of land mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of equipment to, to even be, a, be an option to run your business. So yeah, I mean, shippers are gonna see rates go up and down and cycle through. But at the end of the day, that it's it's the, technology advances that will make, you know, those physical molecules on the dock and all, you know, around the country, uh, cheaper. Maybe, maybe we should do a cost per molecule study. There you <laughs> In go. The LTL industry. Yeah. Yeah. Hey man, this well, was good. We should call this the AI ramble, I think, because it was all kind of AI, but we were, we were a little all over the place, but it was good. We were because it hit on all these other categories. I think totally. unfortunately, yeah. the overall theme was like customer behavior, but the AI is what's going to drive that or add extra automation. So yeah. Yeah. That was good stuff. Was good. Yeah.